Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're continue, continuing with our series of YouTube videos to help you improve your chess game. We haven't done a 20-minute video in a while. A 20-minute video is a video where I take a position, and I have to think about it for 20 minutes, whether I like it or not, to see how much I can see. Now, we don't want the position to be too boring, because then after about 20 seconds, uh, everybody's wasting our time. So we want it to be at least a little interesting, but it doesn't have to be a fascinatingly complicated position. It just has to be one where I can squeeze 20 minutes out. So I, since it's the January 8th, I thought I would pick the eighth game in the US Championship. So let's pull that up. Okay, hit the enter button here, that will do it. Dominguez Sevian. Okay, so let's pick, well, since it's the 8th, we don't want the 8th move, that's too early. How about the 28th move? So let's go through the game quickly. We have an English, c6 line, okay, queen takes, knight c2, interesting, the queen gets hit. This is interesting. I could actually have played openings like this at some point, so it, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Knight moves a million times to get the bishop pair. White's playing it somewhat positionally. Now he gets the bishop back. Stops black from castling. White making some progress. Offers the queen trade. He trades queens. E3 to fix the pawn. White rooks are a little better on the queen side. Rook to the eighth. Knight there. Rook E7. Okay. So here we are, we have um, White's 28th move. So let's think about it, it's now two minutes into the video, let's think about it till we're around 22 minutes into the video. Okay, well the first thing we wanna ask ourselves is what's the material? Material, both sides have a bishop, knight, two rooks, and six pawns. Pawns are symmetric, that's a shame, that means it's kinda of drosh. I'd say White's a little better, his rook on c is the best rook on the board. Uh, the pawn on e4 is a little bit of the target. The knight on b3 has better squares than the knight on f6 does. Um, so white's a little better here. Um, what are both sides trying to do? Well, white can pile up on the e-pawn until black plays f5, and black can't play f5 without taking the knight off the e-pawn. So that's an idea. White could reposition the bishop by playing bishop h3 or bishop f1. Um, white would like to dominate the queen side. Maybe he could bring, bring the rook on b1 over to c1 in, in a lot of lines. The knight on, on b3 has a lot of good squares. It can go to d4 and block the d6 bishop. Uh, sorry, block the d6 rook. It can play knight to c5 and hit the e-pawn and the b-pawn. It can play knight to a5 and just hit the b-pawn and maybe threaten to go knight to c4. So that's a really potentially good knight that he has. What does black want to do? Black wants to probably trade things off and just get his draw here. Um, his rook on the d file can penetrate down to d3 and hit the knight on b3 and the pawn on a3, which is loose. The rook on e7 is protecting the seventh rank. The, deep rook, the d rook is guarding the bishop. The knight on f6 is guarding the pawn on e4. Maybe that knight could go to somewhere else like uh, d5 or g4. Can't go to d7 because the rook takes d8. Uh, knight to e8 doesn't look like much of an idea at the moment. The idea of moving the knight would be maybe to play f5 so that the black pieces don't have to guard the pawn on e4. White can break with f3, but he's not going to want to do that. Uh, black would just probably take, and then that pawn on e3 is super weak. So white's probably not going to do that. So what I'm doing here is I'm just looking at ideas for both sides before I start looking at candidate moves and analyzing them. It's something you always want to do when you're playing slow games. You don't want to just start looking at moves. You want to see what you're trying to do first so that when you make a move, you have an idea of what good things you're doing and what things on the opponent's doing that you might be trying to stop. So you're always doing that. People are always asking me, what are the thought process steps? And I have an earlier video called the five essential thought process the five essential steps and you know one of the steps is to figure out what both sides are trying to do you know that you're not necessarily looking at moves you're looking at ideas like a, an idea would be attack the pawn on e4 
the moves that do that would be moves like knight to c5 and knight to d2 and rook to c4 and you know stuff like that but but the idea is to hit the pawn the idea for black might be to move the knight somewhere and then play f5 so he doesn't have to worry about that you know these ideas kind of go together all right so we know what the ideas are and let's start looking at some specific moves white is really not expecting to win this game but he certainly should be expecting to torture black a little bit. Um, let's look at moving the knight on b3. I think we could use the principle of domination and say that knight c5 is probably better than knight a5. Knight a5 has the only advantage that white can go to c4, but the knight on c5 stops the rook from going to d3, it hits the pawn on e4, hits the pawn on b7. So it looks like c5 is better than a5, but that doesn't say anything about whether knight c5 is better than knight d4. Knight d4 has the advantage of blocking the rook. The disadvantage is, if we look at the next moves after knight to d4, the knight's not going to go to f5, he's not going to go to e6, he's not going to go to c6, he's not going to go to b5. So the main purpose of the knight on d4 is to just kind of mess up black's uh, moves for his pieces and block the rook on d6. If white plays knight d4, black can even play bishop b6 and threaten to uh, win the... Uh, let me get rid of that uh, pop-up there. Oh, do I want to abort it? No, I don't want to abort it. Just go out of the way. Out of the way. All right. Sorry about that. Okay, so... Knight to c5, knight to d4. Knight d4, bishop b6. K black can hit the knight on d4, and where's the knight on d4 going to go? Uh, not so sure about that. Let's look at knight c5 with the same idea. Now, knight c5, bishop b6 isn't as bad, because bishop takes c5, white can play either pawn takes and open the b-file for the rook, or rook takes and not isolate his pawns. On the other hand, what would white do... Bishop b6, the bishop would probably be happy to trade off for the knight on c5. So knight c5, bishop b6, white could then play knight a4, but the bishop can go back to d8 or a7, and I don't think white's making much progress by playing knight c5, knight a4. Um, let's try moving the rook to c1. Rook on b to c1. Suppose black plays rook to d3, hitting the knight. White could then play knight to c5, and black can't play rook takes a3 because of rook takes d8 winning the bishop. Um, by the way, occasionally I get people saying, Dan, why aren't you moving the pieces when you're analyzing so I can follow you? And the answer is, well, in these 20-minute exercises, you're supposed to be working on your visualization, and if I move the pieces around the board, then the people who are following the video aren't practicing their visualization too. You know, they have the advantage. They can pause the video at any point and replay what they heard and try to see what I said. You know, I, you know I'm you know, i trying to get done in the 20 minutes of the 20 minute exercise. And I, I want to do my visualization. I want you to do your visualization. So that's kind of part of the purpose of this is to help you improve your analysis. And if you can't visualize the position when you're doing the analysis, then no matter how good your logic is or your tactics, then your, your analysis isn't going to be very good because you're not going to be able to see what's happening. Okay, so we were looking at the line uh, rook on b to c1, rook to d3, knight to c5, and then black's not happy because he can't play rook takes a3. So that kind of says to you that black probably wouldn't want to play rook d3 to begin with after rook on b to c1 that it's just kind of a waste of time. Maybe he would first move the bishop so he doesn't have to worry about it and then threaten rook to d3. At that point, if white brings his rook off the first rank and plays like rook on one to c3 or something, black can play rook d1 check bishop f1 and, and pin the bishop to the king. And even though black's not going to win that bishop, uh, that's a little annoying. Um, all right, so... Rook on b to c1, what would black do? Um, he could play bishop to b6 to try to keep the knight out of c5 or, or d4. 
White could still put the knight on c5, and if bishop takes, rook takes. But black's making a little bit of progress that way, trading off his inactive bishop that the rook has to guard for the knight. Um, it looks like, but there's almost no way to stop bishop to b6. Let's, I guess we could look at moves like a4, a5 to try to fight that. This happens sometimes in chess. You, you have a move and you don't like it and then you start realizing, well, why don't I play this other move that I didn't even think of first? And maybe that's a candidate move. So maybe white could play a4. Okay, let's take a look at a4. a4, what would black do? If black plays bishop to b6, white could play a5, black would play bishop a7. Then white has gained a little bit of space on the queen side. The b-pawn becomes a little backward. Both b-pawns become a little backward. Um, if, I, if white plays a4, can black play rook b6 to hit the b-pawn? No, because then rook takes d8. So you don't have to worry about that. Can black play something like b5? a4, b5, a takes b5, a takes b5, maybe rook to b8 hitting the pawn. And black would have to play like rook to d5 guarding it. That's kind of awkward. Then maybe knight c5 blocking the rook. So I don't think black can do that. I think a4, b5, a takes b5, a takes b5, rook b8. I guess black could play rook b6 then. Oh, no, he can't because the rook takes d8 anyway. So a4, b5, a takes b8, takes b, rook b8. I guess black can play bishop b6. But then when the knight goes to c5, if the bishop takes and the pawn takes, the pawn on c5 is passed and white's hitting the pawn on b5. And maybe bishop f1 will hit that pawn again. So that might even win a pawn. Okay, on a4, I don't think black can play b5. He could play b6, but that blocks the bishop in, and that's bad. So on a4, black could play rook c7. Then rook takes c7, bishop takes c7. If a5, then maybe rook d3. And no, on rook d3, maybe white has knight c5, forking the rook on d3 and the pawn on b7. So a4, rook c7, rook takes c7, bishop takes c7, a5 with the idea of playing knight c5. Okay, well, black can always play rook to c7 if I don't play rook b1 first. So... I could still play a4 at some point. I could play rook bc1 first. Then after bishop to b6, I can play a4. If then knight rook to d3, white could play knight c5, bishop takes c5. I guess black's okay in that line. Um, rook bc1, bishop b6, a4. Rook to d3. Trying to think if there's anything else white could do. He could play rook on 8 to c3 there, but that looks a little wimpy. Um, as I said, white has the initiative. White's a little better here. I don't think white's winning if black plays properly. I think all my analysis keeps leading to lines where white's a little better. Um... If I had to run Stockfish, and we can do that at the end of the 20 minutes, I would think it would say that White's up by, I don't know, 0.4, something like that. Now, that's me. That's my evaluation skill. And what I found over the years is my analysis skill is a little better than my evaluation skill. In fact, when I started out, my analysis skill was way, way, way better than my evaluation skill. But as the years went on and I got more experience, my evaluation skill got better. But sometimes Stockfish surprises me. And if I say 0.4, he says 1.2. Or if I say 0.4, he says 0.0. .0. So, you know, those things do happen. All right, so back to candidate moves. We're looking at knight d4. We're looking at knight c5. We're looking at a4. We're looking at rook bc1. Rook bc1 stops rook c7. But it does allow rook d3 in some lines. Um, is there anywhere our, our knight could go from c5 that would make any sense? 
Knight c5, bishop to b6. The idea of bishop b6 is just trade off the bishop for that powerful knight. Then knight a4, bishop a7. Can I hit the bishop on a7 with rook to a8? Rook to a8, and then black would have to play something like b5. That's interesting. Knight c5, bishop b6, knight a4, bishop a7, rook a8, b5. Hmm. Then if knight c5, bishop takes c5, b takes c5, white has a pass pawn, white has two isolated pawns on the a and c file. The rook on d6 would have to guard the pawn on a6. He could play rook c6. Now the pawn on c5 is weak. I think black's okay there. Knight to c5. If black plays rook to c7, then rook takes c7, bishop takes c7, knight takes b7, should win. So I don't think he can play rook c7 on knight c5. So knight c5, bishop b6, knight a4, bishop a7, I don't have to play rook a8. I could just play rook on b to c1 to start. Um, but then black could play rook d3, hitting my a pawn. The bishop on a7 is temporarily safe. Um, white could get his rook to the seventh rank, but then black could check. And that could be a little awkward. Um, so knight c5 is not a bad move. I think white has an advantage after knight c5. I think white has the advantage after rook on b to c1 also. I'm not sure which one is more accurate at the moment. Knight d4 is nice, but it doesn't seem to do quite as much. Um, knight a5 to go knight c4. Well, I guess it has one advantage. And that is that when the knight goes to c4, the bishop can't go to b6. Of course, black could play b5, and then the knight has to move again, and that might not be the best thing in the world because he really doesn't have any wonderful places to go. So knight a5, with the idea of knight c4, black can answer knight, knight c4 with moving the rook followed by b5, or even moving the rook first and then playing b5 as soon as the knight goes to c4. I just... I just can't convince myself that knight a5 followed by knight c4, which is a different idea than knight c5, is, is better. Um, if this was a speed game, I would have moved a long time ago, of course. I think in a speed game, my first move would be rook bc1. And I guess it's worth noting that, you know, when you're playing a chess game, you know, you're trying to compare your moves and see which one is better. If you don't like doing that, well, then just play a lot of speed chess and, you know, have some fun and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're trying to improve your game, and I tell this to all the people who come to me for lessons who, you know, play a lot of five and ten minute chess on the internet and they think those are slow games, I tell them, you know, getting to be a better chess player is all about learning how to compare moves and figure out what's going to happen and visualize the future. And, you know, once you're really good at doing that, then if you play a ten minute game, it's not just as funsy anymore. It's a really good game because you know what, what, what are the things you're trying to do. You know, if we, if we have Magnus Carlsen or Hikaru Nakamura play 10-minute chess, you know, they're not just making random moves and seeing what will happen and having some fun. They're actually doing some serious, very quick calculation with some good judgment and some evaluation. But they got that way from playing a million slow tournaments so that they could learn how to play. And people who think that they're just going to play a bunch of fast games and then all of a sudden get really good just because they learned some secret about the Lucena position or how to play the Caro Can, well, those things are very helpful. Those things make you a better player, but they don't really move you up in class unless you really learn how to analyze and evaluate positions. And that's kind of what we're doing in these 20-minute exercises. Okay, so we still have a few minutes to go. As I said, in a speed game, I'd play rook on b to c1. I'm pretty sure I'm not too worried about rook d3, as long as the bishop's hanging. 
my two top candidates are rook b c1 and knight c5. And if I play knight c5, the nice news is he can't play rook c7 because if rook takes c7, bishop takes c7, knight takes b7, and I think white's going to be winning. But I guess, I guess on knight c5, he can't play knight d7 because if knight takes b7, doesn't look right. If he plays knight b6 hitting my rook, I can play knight takes d6 hitting the rook. So that's 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 ridiculous. He's not going to do that. Knight c5, I think he's going to play bishop b6. And he's not really... I mean, he's threatening to get rid of my nice, nice knight and make my advantage a little less. As I said, I, I could play a4. a4 is not an unreasonable move. If I could get a4 and a5 in and then play knight c5, then black's in some trouble because he can't easily get my knight out of c5 and the bishop on d8 becomes really trapped. The problem is he has a tempo after a4. After a4, he can play bishop b6. And if I play a5 and he plays bishop a7, well, I know when I looked at rook a8, we were looking at him playing b5. Maybe white can take on Poisson and get something. Maybe getting get something going because if rook takes, then I can play knight c5 or something. Let's let's look at that line. A4, bishop b6, a5, bishop a7, rook a8, b5. A takes b5. If he plays bishop takes, sorry, a takes b6 on Poisson. If he plays bishop takes b6, I have rook takes a6, and I think that gets away with a pawn scot free. So let's say he plays rook takes b6, hitting my b pawn. Then I play knight c5, which does two things. It guards the b pawn with the rook on b1, and it hits the pawn on a6, which I can't take right away but could become a nuisance. Now, black might be able to play um, a5 there, and white can't play b takes a5 because the rook takes b1 check. If you don't believe me, I'll show you what I'm looking at. I'm looking at a4, bishop b6, a5, bishop a7, rook a8 hitting the bishop, b5 guarding the bishop with the rook, a takes b6 on passant. If he takes with the bishop, I take the pawn. Rook takes, knight c5, a5. That's the line I was looking at, and I said, if I take the pawn, he takes my rook check. Except I circled the wrong square. So that was true. You know, uh, I'm visualizing the board exactly as what's happening. Is this bad for white? No, but black might be getting getting out of this here. I'd have to look at this some more. His e4 pawn is a little bit hit, but the b4 pawn is a problem. White can just play b5 here. Let's go back to the game. All right, so, so a4 is the third candidate. The three candidates are rook b c1, knight c5, and a4. Well, I guess my 20 minutes is about up. Um, I don't think any of those moves gives white a winning position. I think they're all interesting. a4 is a little more forcing. Rook b c1 is solid. Knight c5 is consequential. So let's ask Stockfish. We're going to ask him two things. One, what's the top three moves? And two, how good is White's position on the best move? So I'm going to get uh, my top three are rook bc1, knight c5, a4. If that's the same as the computers, I would be absolutely shocked because there's so many things that White can do and they're, they're reasonable. So there's no reason why White needs to do those. But those are my top three. And my evaluation is like 0.4. So let's see how let's see how bad Stockfish makes me look. Sometimes Stockfish makes me look really brilliant. Sometimes Stockfish makes me look really bad. All right, Stockfish, top three moves. Here we go. All right. Well, one out of three ain't bad. All right. So <clears throat> right now. A4 is leading the pack, and the really weird move H3 to stop the knight from going to G4 and E5 is second. Now Bishop H3, which also stops the knight from going to G4, is in the top three. And A4 is at 
And it says after a a4, black should play rook d5, and then white should play bishop f1. Okay, so let's make that move just for the fun of it. Let's say we play a4 and black does play bishop b6. It says white should play a5. If black plays bishop a7, so now rook a8 is not the right move. White should play the wonderful move bishop to f1, a move I didn't look at, which is much better than any move on the board, pretty much winning the game for white. Okay, well, that's why Stockfish is rated like 3550 and I'm not. Okay, well, bishop f1. Well, I thought white was doing better here, but I didn't I didn't have him at point uh, 1.66, which is what Stockfish has here. Okay, so today was our 20-minute exercise. Let's see what was played in the game. Um, sometimes I do these exercises, and the first comment I get is, but Dan, you didn't show us what happened in the game. All right, so let's, let's see what happened in the game. White did play a4. Very good for Grandmaster Dominguez. We'll turn off Stockfish. Let's see what happened in the next few moves. Knight d5 instead of rook d5. Rook pins the knight. Bishop over. We'll make a bunch of quick moves here. The knight takes the pawn. Doesn't look like white did anything but force a draw here. Looks like black's actually better. All right, so we have a rook and pawn endgame where white is down a pawn, but all the pawns are on the king's side. Black says, I'll go after those pawns. Now he has a past H pawn. Now he won another pawn. Now black's completely winning. So Grandmaster Dominguez was was better in the at the 20 minute position from Sevian and now he's losing. I expect him to resign in a few moves. White's completely passive here. Now he's down three pawns. That's probably it. Okay, so white won. Hopefully you enjoyed our 20 minute video. I forget how many we've had now. Maybe this is the fourth one or so. But, uh, you know, if you enjoyed it, please tell your friends. That's the number one thing you can do. Tell your friends about our channel, Dan Heisman Chess. You can subscribe. You can like the video. And we'll be there again to help you next time. Thanks a lot. See you then. Bye.